Well, good evening to you all, my Victory Through Faith Church family and friends. This is Pastor Jay. I speak and I decree the blessing of the Lord over your lives. I pray that all is going well with you. And it's my prayer that all will go well for you. I'm excited to share the word with you today. We're going to continue walking through Ephesians. This is actually lesson 14. We started at verse one, chapter one, and we're going to go all the way to the last verse in chapter six. So today we're going to start in chapter four of walking through Ephesians. Last week I shared with you that the first three chapters of Ephesians are pretty much doctrinal. They they lay out the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Chapters four through six show us how to live godly lives. So in these last three chapters and however many weeks it takes us to walk through it, we should learn how to live a godly lifestyle. I believe that you're going to be blessed by what we cover in the coming weeks. So before we get any further, before we go any further, let's go before the Lord in prayer because we want to ensure the Holy Spirit is involved in what we're doing this evening. So, Father God, I thank you for another opportunity to teach your word. I pray that as your word goes forth, it goes forth with accuracy and simplicity. We rebuke and bind all distractions, all hindrances. And I pray that your word has free course, that it pierces to the hearts of every person that hears it. And that wisdom and revelation knowledge flow freely, Lord God. I present myself to you as a willing vessel to be used for your glory. So I pray that everything you desire to say and everything that you desire to do will be said and done in today's message. In Jesus name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, like I've heard a pastor say and I adopted it for my own life. One word from God can change your life. So as we get into the lesson today, look for your one word, because that one word can change the trajectory of your life for the positive. So let's get into it again. We are walking through Ephesians. This is lesson 14, and we're going to begin with chapter four. Uh, I was anticipating getting from verses one through six. Uh, truth be told, or honestly, in all transparency, we probably won't go past verse three. This is one of those passages where you've got to break it down and really explain what we're talking about so we can have some clarity and we'll be able to actually apply what we're reading and learning. So let's pick up at chapter four. Uh, again, now we're entering into what a godly lifestyle looks like, how believers should function, how believers should carry themselves. That's going to be the overall theme for the next three chapters. We're learning how we and that's one of the reasons I really wanted to walk through Ephesians, because many of us have been saved uh, for many years and we still don't know what it's supposed to look like, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. What are the choices we are supposed to make? How are our lives supposed to look in relation to the world around us? So I pray that you've been rocking with me, uh, at least for the majority of these up of these previous lessons. And I really pray that you're rock with me for the rest of the lessons, because we're going to really learn what we as God's children are supposed to look like how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and how we are supposed to interact with the world around us. It's, it's going to be good. I, I wish I could get it all in one day, but that's just not feasible. So let's get into it. Verse chapter one of uh, verse one of chapter four, it says, I therefore, and this is Paul. He's the writer to the Ephesians under the inspiration of Holy Spirit. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So we've already identified when he says, I therefore, this is Paul, because he wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus and he calls himself a prisoner of the Lord, or you could say a bond servant of the Lord or a slave to the Lord. Paul, in, a, in other words, Paul was saying, there are things I have to do for the Lord that I don't necessarily get excited about. But excitement is not a requirement for obedience. <laughs> OK, I don't have to be excited about what God tells me to do 
to be obedient to what he instructs me to do. So Paul says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I gave up my rights. I gave up my privileges and I am a prisoner of the Lord. And he goes on to say, and because I'm a prisoner, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So I want to talk about that from verse one. What does it mean to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are? were called or wherewith you are called. Well, we know worthy just means appropriately. So we can read it this way. You should walk appropriately according to the vocation that you were called to. And that word vocation really just means calling. So you can read it this way. I beseech you, or I beg you that you walk worthy or appropriately of the calling wherewith you are called. You might not have you might not understand this, but as a believer, you are called. Every believer has a calling. Primarily, we are called to the message and the ministry of reconciliation. You find out about that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, towards the end of that round, verses 17 through 20. It talks about how every believer has the message and the ministry, or the word and the ministry of reconciliation. That means you tell people what God has done for you personally. You tell people how God has reconciled you to himself through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And now that we understand that we are in Christ, remember we are talking about our in Christ realities all throughout this lesson series. Understanding that we are in Christ means we are called to walk a certain way. All those who are in Christ Jesus are called to live a certain way. That's why Paul was saying you need to walk worthy of the vocation to which you were called. Once you give your life to Christ, you are called into a ministry. You are called unto a message and you must walk in a way that's worthy or appropriate to what you've been called into. That's what vocation means. It means a calling. So my calling is to represent the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, glory to God, and then all the things will be added unto you. Vocation is even deeper than calling because it also refers to the, listen to this, the vocation or the calling that you've been called to. That, vo that word vocation is actually a reference to, check this out, the divine invitation to embrace salvation in the kingdom of God. Walk worthy of the calling everybody had. OK, that's good. I didn't see that before, Lord. That's good. The calling is for everyone, but not everybody is called. I'll say that again. The calling is for everyone. The invitation to embrace salvation in the kingdom of God. That's for everybody. For God so loved the who? world that he gave his only begotten son. So the calling is for everyone, but not many are called or not many respond to the calling through obedience, through accepting the divine invitation and embracing salvation in the kingdom of God. The Bible says that it's God's will that none be lost, but that all be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. All don't, that's good. All don't respond to the call. Those of us who have responded to the call, Paul is letting us know through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we should walk a certain way. We should walk appropriately related to the calling that we have responded to. Now that we are the called, we should walk a certain way. We should walk differently. There is a certain way you got to live and move in the kingdom of God. You just can't move how you, it's a kingdom. It is a kingdom ruled by a king and a king sets the terms. A king decides how we move. And so although we are free moral agents, we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ and we must live a certain way. Our lives should reflect who our Lord is. If Jesus is our Lord, then our lives should reflect that lordship. That's what Paul was saying. Hey, you need to walk in a manner or walk in a way that's worthy of the vocation that you were called to. You've got a calling. You responded to that calling. Now walk appropriately. Walk in a way that represents the calling to which you have been called. Amen. That it's, it's no different than a husband and a wife. You could be single. Maybe you were single till you were 31 years old. 
at 31 you got engaged at 32 you got married when you became married you responded to a calling for partnership with one person for the rest of your life as a married man or as a married woman you have to conduct yourself differently than you did when you were single because of the calling for marriage that you responded to your lifestyle has to change the way you move has to change. Your priorities have to shift. What you deem important takes a back seat to what best benefits the marriage. And if it works for marriage, it works for salvation. We actually are. The church is actually referred to as the bride of Christ. So we're married to him. And it's our responsibility to live in a way that glorifies God. We must walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we were called again that just means that as believers as children of god there is a certain way that we are called to live and that's part of the reason why i believe this teaching is so important because once you know the way you're called to live it becomes a little easier to begin to embrace that way it's easy to say well you got to live a certain way for god okay how what does it look like? How am I supposed to conduct myself in certain situations? Ephesians is an awesome book to walk us through that. Amen. So let's look at verse two. Now, verse one is what we're supposed to do. Verse two starts to lay out what it looks like. Yeah. Verse one is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called and in verses two and three it lays out what that looks like it begins to lay out what that looks like so i call it markers of a godly lifestyle that's what the spirit of god gave me as i was preparing this so verses two and three outline what we call markers or identifiers of a godly lifestyle if i am called to walk worthy of the vocation to which i was called to then there should be some some identifiers for instance i'm a married man i wear an identifier that i'm married because i'm married i wear a ring it does not wearing a ring does not make me married because i'm married i wear a ring there's a difference because a single man can wear a ring and not have a and not have a, a spouse so it's not the wearing of the ring that makes me married because i embrace the marriage calling and the marriage covenant one of my identifiers one of my markers is this ring well in the same way verses two and three are markers identifiers that we should wear that let people know who we're connected to that's so good holy spirit we should wear these markers of lowliness and meekness and long suffering forbearing one another these are markers that identify who we're connected to so let's look at verse two verse one says i therefore the prisoner of the lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called how do we do that you walk worthy of the vocation that you were called to with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace so let's talk about that what are we pastor jay what are you talking about lowliness and meekness and long suffering and forbearing one another what are you talking about okay as a born again woman or man of god it's our responsibility to put on christ to put on the new man and the new man is identified by godly markers godly identifiers things that we embrace to demonstrate who we're connected to just like i said i wear a ring to demonstrate that i'm connected to someone in the same way these are markers of a godly lifestyle when it, it says with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Lowliness means modesty or humility. So a believer of God should embrace modesty, humility. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't wear bright colors and you can't wear, wear flashy jewelry because modesty is a position of the heart or the mind. Actually, modesty is more of a mindset because lowliness means modesty and humility. 
this is more about mindset than po possessions. Well, they don't wear name brands. They're so lowly. Or they don't wear flashy jewelry. They're so lowly. No, no, it's not about what you wear outwardly. It's how you're wired inwardly that determines whether or not lowliness is something that you wear. Lowliness means modesty. Lowliness means humility. Again, this is about a mindset. One of my favorite texts, and if you allow me to, I'll turn to Philippians chapter two. One of my favorite texts because it tells me that I can be like Christ. Philippians chapter two, uh, verses five through eight says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that God wouldn't tell me to let something be in me if it were not possible. So that means that you and I can possess the mind of Christ. Let's find out what the mind of Christ looks like. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. See, nobody can make you humble. That's something you have to embrace on your own. People can try to humiliate you, but they cannot humble you because humility is a position that that's so good. Lord, thank you for that. Humility is a position that's based on a decision. Oh, that's so good. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Humility is a position, a mindset based on a decision. I've decided to not embrace pride. I've decided to take the low road. And humility opens the door for God to elevate you. There are so many scriptures that tell us about that, but let's go a little further. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Verse eight is the operative verse. It says, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Many people are trying to be obedient, but they won't humble themselves. See, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. If you want to be obedient, you got to humble yourself. You got to realize that God knows more than I do. God sees more than I do. God has more than I do. So I can't be God in my own life. I humble myself. Notice it didn't say that God humbled him. It says Jesus humbled himself. And once he humbled himself, the next logical step was to become obedient. In the same way, that's what lowliness does for us. It causes us to embrace modesty and humility. We humble ourselves and then we become obedient amen that's one of the markers of a godly lifestyle lowliness modesty humility humility is not self-abasement where i'm always beating myself down and no that's that's false humility that's that's what worldly people do to try to appear humble humility is just simply not thinking i know more than god to not act like i've got more understanding than god has and because i know he knows more than i do I humble myself under the mighty hand of God. Hallelujah. I humble myself under his lordship. I, hunder, I humble myself under the rule and the reign and the lordship of my savior, Jesus Christ, trusting him to lead my life and guide my path and direct my steps. Amen. What's the next marker of a godly lifestyle? Meekness. Now, when you hear meekness, we typically think what? We think soft spoken. Uh, you know, I don't I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to make anybody mad. I just want to get along with everybody. No, meekness is gentleness. It's mildness. It's, if lowliness is a mindset, meekness is a way of being. That means I'm not going to be abrasive. I'm not going to, ah, uh, man, oh my goodness. Anybody ever met an abrasive Christian? <laughs> I know you have because I have. We've all met. Hey, I don't know. You might be watching this. You might be an abrasive Christian. You're still a Christian. Nevertheless, you just need to develop in the meekness aspect of a godly lifestyle. Meekness means gentleness. It means mildness. This is about a way of being. I'm not going to force my own way. I'm not going to try to make everybody do it the way I think it needs to be done. One of my earliest examples of gentleness and meekness coupled with humility was uh, I was I was much much. I was a child, not even old enough to drive. 
and I was visiting uh, the house of our, one of our church members. And this particular lady, uh, her, she, had, she has uh, three sons. And I came over, so I was the fourth guy over there, and we were outside playing and doing what boys do. And when she came to the house, she had a bag full of sodas. Well, look, 12 ounce cans of soda. Uh, if I remember correctly, they might have been, no, because one was a grape coat. So they were, I guess, what, Pepsi, whatever they were, they were canned sodas. And of course, we're outside playing. And so we see her come out of the car and she has a bag full of sodas and she lets us know that she has them. So everybody runs to the bag to get a soda and everybody's picking what they want and choosing what they want. And there was one uh, child and one of her sons. I, I want to say it was her middle son that he instead of fighting for the one he wanted, he just he told her to give her whatever she had. That was a. A, a sign or a marker of gentleness and mildness. He was the only one out of us because I was right there with him groping for the soda I wanted most. But he didn't force his own way because he was humble. His way of being was gentle. Oh, that's good. That's good. Let, listen to this. Because he was humble, his way of being was gentle. Because he embraced lowliness, his way of being was meekness, mild gentleness not not loud and boisterous and abrasive markers of a godly lifestyle include meekness we shouldn't always be abrasive we should now there are sometimes you gotta defend yourself there are sometimes you have to i call it righteous indignation where you your octaves might go up a few levels or you might have to raise your voice or you might have to let people know what you're standing on and what you're standing for and you can still do that without being abrasive. You can stand for the truth without being abrasive. Abrasive is just a way of being for no reason at all. You just your words cut, your 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 mannerisms cut, you know, your your the way you look at people cuts. Well, that's not a marker of a godly level. There shouldn't be any spooky Christians. We should be approachable because we have love dwelling inside of us. So one of the markers of a godly lifestyle is meekness. Again, that is a way of being as lowliness is a mindset, uh, modesty and humility. Meekness is more gentleness, it's mildness, it's not forcing my own way. We go on to see that in Ephesians chapter four, we've got another marker of a godly lifestyle, and that is Long suffering, long suffering. Now, what is long suffering, Pastor Jay? Long suffering is just a King James word for patience uh, or perseverance. You know, when you're long suffering, you're patient with people. Uh, you persevere with people. Again, this is a mindset where I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to persevere. We run out. OK, I, I can attest to that. I, I can run out of patience. I can run out of perseverance. But we can tap into a uh, godly reserve because we have the spirit inside of us. And when we run out of our allotment of patience, we can say, Holy Spirit, help me to be more patient. Holy Spirit, help me to tap into the fruit of the spirit. And, and let me exercise some patience here because I, I, I'm about to write them off. I'm done. I've, I've given them far more time than they needed. They have not done what they needed to do. But the mark of a godly lifestyle is long suffering patience and perseverance. We should all embrace that. Who are you writing off too soon? Who have you given up on that? If you would have stuck with them for just a little bit longer, they would have had a breakthrough. Yeah, when we're talking about long suffering, we've heard other people say that means you suffer long. That means I'm going to I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to help you through this. I'm going to pray that the spirit of God gives me the strength to walk you through this thing and to help you through. This is assuming that the person that you're fighting with and persevering with has the same fire for overcoming that you do. If you're uh, this does not qualify when a person has no desire to overcome. You saying, well, I'm a I'm, I'm a be patient with I'm a persevere with you, but they aren't even trying. You're wasting your time. This is assuming that both all parties involved want the same thing are headed in the same direction, but you might or you might be at a place to where you're about ready to throw in the towel where you it's just 
It's taking all your physical energy. It's taking all your mental energy. That's when we can tap into long suffering. It's a mindset. I'm, I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to bear with you. I'm going to make sure that we get through this thing together. That should be the marker of a godly lifestyle. If long suffering is a mindset like lowliness is, forbearing is a way of being that's connected to long suffering. Again, it says with all lowliness and meekness, lowliness being the mindset, meekness being the way of being, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So long suffering is the mindset, forbearing is the way of being, and the only way we can do that is in love because long suffering is patience and perseverance forbearing means to endure and to put up with you ever had to put up with something before you ever had to put up with somebody before well you knew they were lying you knew before they opened their mouth they were gonna lie but you you endured it and you put up with it because you knew that if you just stuck stuck it out it will work out in your favor yeah, there are there are times when you will have to deal with people and you know they're being manipulative. You know, they're lying to you. You know, they're being disingenuous. God will help you forbear it. How? What does the scripture say? Forbearing one another in love. Now, this term love actually refers to affection for Christians. So let me be clear. Let me make this. Let me put this disclaimer out here. When we're talking about lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, we are talking about what other men and women of God. Okay. Isn't, we're not, cause if you're trying to be long suffering and forbearing with a heathen, or you're trying to be long suffering and forbearing with somebody that does not make Jesus Christ their Lord and savior, you in for a fight. You in for some unnecessary trauma. The implication here is that we're all believers and the marker of a godly lifestyle is that we conduct ourselves this way, especially with other believers. Because when it says forbearing, forbearing one another in love, that word love means affection for other Christians. Yeah, it's agape. And we know we hear the God kind of love. That's what you typically hear people refer to agape. And yet and still it's deeper than that. It means having affection for Christians. I have affection for you just because you're a fellow brother or sister in Christ. And because you're a fellow brother and sister in Christ, I will be forbearing towards you. I'm going to endure maybe some disappointments. I'm going to put up with some behavior that maybe maybe the person is loud and you're quiet and stoic and they're loud and demonstrative. Well, I'm going to endure their uh, opposite way of being versus me because they're still a Christian and I'm forbearing one another in love. Yeah, this helps us to deal with people that we typically wouldn't deal with. I'm talking about believers because it's a marker of a godly life. I'm forbearing. I endure. I put up with something that might trigger me. I won't even say trigger. I put up with something that I'm wired differently toward. Maybe you don't talk a lot, but maybe somebody in your circle goes 100 miles a minute nonstop. Well, you love them enough to endure how they are, even though it's completely 180 degrees from your way of being. Really, we could sum it up by saying this love is the driving force for this godly lifestyle. You can't have lowliness, you can't have meekness, you can't have long suffering, and you definitely won't be able to forbear anyone without love being your driving force. It's, that's why it says lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another. How? In love. The reason I can forbear what typically would frustrate me is because I'm rooted and grounded in love. Hallelujah. Now let's look at verse three. Verse three shows us another godly marker. It says endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What are we talking about, Pastor Jay? Well, first, let me lay this out for you. Holy Spirit. And I say Holy Spirit because he's not a thee. He's a person. I don't say the melody when I'm talking about my wife. I don't say the Leonard when I'm talking about my father. I call them by name or I call them by title. So in the same way, when we're talking about Holy Spirit, I am training myself to remove thee from the equation. So 
endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of keep the unity of Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. What does that mean? Well, that simply means the Holy Spirit is the common shared denominator for every child of God. And he unites us through peace. I'll say that again. Holy Spirit is the common shared denominator for every child of God. And he unites us through peace. Now we have to accept Jesus as Lord in order to become a child of God. Once we become a child of God, everybody has the same experience. What is that pastor J Holy spirit moves into our spirit and he seals us until the day of redemption. We all, <laughs> that's funny. I will say that we all share the same experience. Listen to me. Whether you speak in tongues or not, you still have Holy Spirit dwelling in your spirit. He moves in at the new birth. When you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit moves in and seals your reborn human spirit until the day of redemption. He preserves your spirit man flawless so that when Christ comes back, your flawless spirit man can be reunited or united with your glorified body and you'll be a perfected being. Hallelujah. You're not perfected right now. You got to wait till Christ comes back. In the meantime, the only part of you that is perfect is your reborn human spirit that's sealed by Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, at which point when Christ comes back, your glorified body will be united with your sealed by the Holy Spirit, freshly delivered spirit. And now you'll be a perfected, completed, mature being. Until then, Holy Spirit is the common denominator that every believer shares. We have faith in Christ. We have love for God and we all share the same spirit. He unites us through peace. That's what it says. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. When I first began reading this, my thoughts were, I kept processing, okay, peace is the glue. Peace is the glue, but actually peace is not the glue. Love is the glue. Love is what keeps us all connected. Love is the, that's good, Lord. Love is the life force of the body of Christ because God is love. So when it says endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, we need to know what those terms mean in order to understand what God is saying. Endeavoring just means being diligent or laboring. So regardless of where I am in life, I am laboring to keep the unity of the spirit. I don't want to be in discord with anybody. I don't want to be. And you can look at the climate of the church right now. There is so much disunity and discord. Why? Because we aren't endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. The spirit of God is not about division. He's about unity. We are one body with many members and we should endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What is peace? But this is good. This is good. Listen to this. I found this in my studies. When you're endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, peace means harmony or concord or agreement. So if I'm endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of harmony and agreement, what do I need to do that? The bond of peace. What is what is bond mean? It's a uniting principle. So because we have peace with God, we should also be at peace with man. Hallelujah. Because we are at peace with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We should also be at peace with man. So that bond or that uniting principle of peace keeps us in the flow of Holy Spirit. Endeavoring means I'm always diligent. I'm laboring. I'm making sure that whatever I do keeps me in the flow. And unity, of course, means agreement. It means oneness. So when you say endeavoring to keep the unity or the agreement or the oneness of the spirit in the bond or in the uniting principle of peace, that's what our responsibility is. We should endeavor. We should labor. We should be diligent to stay in agreement and harmony and concord with one another, with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. There should be no division. Let there be no strife. Let there be no division. We should be unified. That's what a body is. It's many members unified as one cohesive unit. The members of the body must operate in harmony with each other in order to be effective. That's so good. The members of the body, 
your hands, your feet, your shoulders, your, your knees, your ankles, your hips, your torso, your ears, your mouth, your nose, your eyes. They all have to work in harmony with each other for the body to be effective. I'm telling my hand to wave right now and it's doing exactly what I'm telling it to do. Why? Because I am an integrated person. My mind and my body is working together. My, my bones and my blood, they're all working for the same goal, for me to move and live and have my being. Amen. Well, in the same way, the body of Christ should function together. Maybe we don't worship on the same day. Maybe we don't have the same dress code. Maybe we don't sing the same songs. Maybe different parts of the Bible speak up, speak to us more than other parts of the Bible. As long as we are united in the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, he is the only begotten of the Father, as long as we believe that he died, he was buried, he was raised from the dead, he ascended to, the, to be seated at the right hand of the Father. He was given a name that's above every other name. If we can agree on those terms that Jesus is Lord, we should be able to work out all the other distinctions. Unity and peace. And I'll say this and then we'll get ready to lock it down. I want to show you something. And I believe it's occurring and about to i believe there's a renaissance of this happening a reoccurrence and a renaissance of this taking place while i was studying this the spirit of god spoke to my heart and said unity and peace is what is what facilitates explosive church growth unity and peace is what facilitates explosive church growth hallelujah now i want to show you the proof text of that or the 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 example of that precept, the spirit of God revealed to me that unity and peace, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, unity and peace are what facilitates explosive church growth. If you want the body of Christ to grow, if, you, if we want the body of Christ to dominate, if we want the body of Christ to do what we are called to do, we need unity and we need peace. Look at what happens when you got unity and peace in Acts chapter two, verses 41 through 47. It says, <clears throat> then they that gladly received his word were baptized, the word that Peter just finished preaching. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. So there's unity and there's peace and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things in common because there's unity and there's peace and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need and they continuing continuing daily with one accord, unity and peace in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, unity and peace did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, unity and peace, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When we embrace unity and peace, it facilitates explosive church Growth, And I believe that we're in the beginnings of that right now, that as we embrace unity and peace, we're going to cross denominational lines. We're going to cross racial lines. We're going to cross ethnic, ethnic lines. Hallelujah. And as we embrace how the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, the Holy Spirit is going to help us do it. And as we do it, we are going to see explosive church growth. We'll have all things in common and we will shine as the light of the world. Amen. Praise God. Well, that's all I've got for you today. We only got through three verses, but we knew that going in. Tune in next week. We'll start with verse four, chapter four, and we'll keep walking through Ephesians. Amen. Remember this until next time you are empowered by faith. You are equipped for service and your success is in God's word. I love you. Be blessed in Jesus name.